We'll pick up inshallah where we left off. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala alhadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. So at the end of the conversation, we we defined a new term, a term that's found in the field, and it's not an illness or a disease or anything like that, but it's a psychological term or what they call a psychological phenomenon called cognitive dissonance. And today I'd like to bring that into conversation from an Islamic psychology lens, of really looking at it from more, le less of a just cognitive perspective, but more from a psycho-spiritual dissonance. Because for some, it is cognitive, right? What is this definition? We'll define it again. It's basically a psycho cognitive dissonance is a psychological phenomenon in which a person holds two related but contradictory thoughts or cognitions. I would like to tweak this and say, for many people, they're actually living in what we would call a psycho-spiritual dissonance, where they're going about their life and you might stop them and say, oh, you're a fellow Muslim. Do you believe in God? Absolutely. Believe in the prophet? Absolutely. Believe in the last day? Absolutely. Believe in judgment? Absolutely. But then you see their actions and kind of the, the work that they're doing on a daily basis and as the verses in Surah Al-Kahf that, that we covered today mention, they may not be accepted. You put forward deeds but without the right intention or behavior. There's some discussion on whether that's actually accounting. So here I'd like to introduce you to something that I learned from one of my spiritual teachers. And because our deen, our religion, is a religion of transmission, meaning student to teacher, student to teacher, and you are meant to cite where you learned something and who came up with it and where you got it from so you know that way you can transmit it consistently. So for anybody who likes the next concept I'm going to mention, this comes from one of my teachers and her name is Anse Sosan Aimadi. So if you mention this concept, I ask you to please cite where you're getting it from, inshallah. But she would say a very beautiful thing and she would say to us as students, she would say, you need to check your vision. <laughs> And we would say, like, as in to go to the eye doctor and check our vision, she'd say, no, your spiritual vision. She would say, you need to wear your akhira glasses. You need to go get your vision checked. <laughs> Something would come up. And we would say, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? Akhira, your akhira glasses. She says, think about a person who wears glasses, right, or contacts. If they took those glasses off, what happens? What happens? Everything is kind of hazy in front of them. They can't quite see well. So she would say what happens when you wear glasses is you fix the vision. Well, there's such a thing as the dunya vision, right? Like you go to the eye doctor for it. But there's also akhira vision and akhira glasses. And the question that she would ask us is how real is the akhira to you? The akhira meaning the last day or the hereafter. How real is the akhira to you? And she reminds us of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and where he said, the worldly comforts are not from me. I am like a traveler who takes rest under a tree in the shade and then goes on his way. In this, looking at this hadith, you realize that we are just travelers on this dunya and in this life. As real as this world seems, and as real as the stuff in it seems, everything seems real. This All this desk that I'm sitting on, it all seems so real. And it is for now, but it's not the everlasting reality. The akhirah is what is reality. And this is what a believer believes. So how do you get that belief and your actions to be in accordance with one another aligned and not in dissonance from one another? And so she would tell us, Put your akhira glasses on, mashallah. And it would ask us questions like, if you saw a little kid right now, you know, you, you the adults are sitting talking and a little kid wanders into the kitchen and comes back with a knife and they, they don't know, they don't, they don't know what this is. They think it's a toy. So they're, they're playing with it. What would all those adults do? They would all get up and rush to that child and, and grab that knife out of their hand because as adults, they know what that danger of a knife could do to a child who doesn't know any better and doesn't know how to handle something dangerous. You would react the same way with a little tiny kid toddling around a pool. And when you know that little tiny kid can't swim, you're all going to try to catch him before he or she falls into that pool. Right? 
And you would say on that knife, you would say, oh my goodness, that's endangering their life. Help, help, go ca catch that child or take the knife away. And then our teacher would ask us, what about things that endanger their akhira, that endanger your akhira? You're worried about the knife and uh, a cut on a physical body. But what about the hereafter? What about knowing that your child has reached the age of puberty and needs to get up and pray fajr, the morning prayer, or better yet, you <laughs> need to get up and pray it? Where is all the fuss of all the adults who ran and grabbed that knife out of that kid's hand? Where is all the fuss on getting them up for fajr prayer or yourselves? You see, what happens is a psycho-spiritual dissonance where we are not in accordance with and aligned with our belief system. The things we say we believe, but our actions show otherwise. Because just like the knife in a small child's hand that's endangering them potentially, not doing the things Allah has asked us for endangers our eternal and everlasting life. You must react. You must have the same fervor of getting protecting that little kid from falling into the pool. The same fervor has to happen from protecting your child and yourself from not doing your daily prayers. For not living in accordance to how Allah asked us. My favorite example she would give is about the white couch. And she would say, if you happen to have a white couch, I don't know who buys white couches when they have children, but maybe some people do. <laughs> and she would say, what happens when that little kid accidentally pours the red colored juice onto the white couch? Ah, oh. <laughs> there's a big flare up that happens, right? And there's a big emotional reaction that happens. SubhanAllah. And the adults may lose it, literally lose their cool, lose their composure over this. You might even see anger. You might even see crying, loud voices. And then the question comes, if a person isn't wearing their akhira glasses, the question is, were those same tears, anger, and upset feeling? When that child or yourself was not acting in accordance of the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to be, whether that be the way we dress in modesty, whether that be in prayer, whether that be in giving in charity, whether that be fasting. As a physician, I have been asked this question so many times, and I'm ready to say it on public. <laughs> in public. As a physician, I too have trained on all the million exams they have us trained to be certified and licensed and all the rest. And when the month of Ramadan came in, we fasted through all of it. This is a healthy person, of course, a person who has health. I'm not talking about somebody who has an excuse by the Sharia to not fast. That's not our lesson today. But do you know how many individuals, spouses and parents have come up to me and said, is it okay for so-and-so not to fast because they're taking their medical exams? And I said, oh, on whose earth? On whose, <laughs> and who's, and who's, who's giving the fatwa, right? SubhanAllah. And our lesson today is not a fiqh lesson, but it's one that then questions into account, is your, are your akhira glasses on? Because if you're at a point where you believe that the failing of this one exam is going to jeopardize all of the ability for you to earn a living in the halal, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there's something askew with our vision. I say these things and sometimes they're heavy and sometimes people aren't very happy with me. But I do think it's important that we realize that we are sometimes living in a psycho-spiritual dissonance from the realities of what Allah, that we say, right? That the beliefs that we say, yes, I believe, amen to amen to, I believe. But then not actually acting in accordance, whether ourselves or our households, the people, our loved ones, or people we're in charge of, such, such as our children. And I'll close this by reminding us the way the Prophet ﷺ reminded us. And he said, we humans are like moths. We're attracted to the fire, like a moth is attracted to light or to fire. 
And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and I'm here trying to save you from this fire. He said, I'm like a warner to his people who are in great danger. There is an army coming to attack them and the army is close, so close that I don't even have the time to warn them. So I take off my outer garment and I share and I kind of try to warn them in a distance this is coming. That hopefully someone sees the alert, the alert that this is happening. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is how close the day of judgment is to us. A sense of urgency. A sense of urgency when a person has correct akhirah vision, they start to see how blessed they are to have the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as their guide and example. They see him as kamil, that he has taught us everything and he brought with him the message of perfection from Allah azza wa jal. That with a person with akhirah vision, they don't ask questions like, why did the Qur'an say this or why did the Prophet do that? They came and understood that this deen in, to in its totality is perfection. So then their questions are not petty anymore. They're more lofty. You can ask questions. The issue isn't asking. The believer asks and has no haya or has any, um, uh, there's no uh, shyness or modesty in asking these questions. Ask, but they're not petty questions. And their questions with sincerity. And lastly, I'm going to tell you a beautiful example by Sheikh Sha'rawi, who was a mufassir of the Quran. He was a famous linguist exegete of the Quran. He used to give tafsir or explanation of what the verses of the Quran mean. And he had this beautiful example that I would also hear my own teachers share often. And he would say, to, he would say, look, Humanity found itself in darkness. Every person in humanity tried to dispel this darkness. So some people came forward and figured out a match. They had a match, right? Give you a little bit of light. Some said, put it on a candle, and now you have a little more light. Some figured out electricity. Some said, a light bulb. Others said, well, how about a lot of light bulbs on a chandelier? <laughs> Others even invented such bright, bright, bright light. Like think about a stadium. Do you know the stadium lights? They can play games, right? Athletic games in sports games in the dark of the night. But these bright stadium lights are on that while you're in there, it seems like it's daylight. It's so bright. And then he said, but when the sun comes up in the morning, you literally have to squint to figure out if the stadium lights are still on. And then he said, the stadium lights are the best that the humanity in their feeble effort, even though they think they're great efforts, but feeble effort can do. And the sun, the nur, the light of the sun is like the message that came with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then you realize, that that sunlight so outweighs all the other lights that they're not even needed. These invented forms of human ideologies and concepts that sound amazing and great, but they don't compare. They pale in comparison to the message of the Prophet ﷺ and this deen. And so to not have a psycho-spiritual dissonance requires us to use the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as our yardstick. You begin to measure the ideas and ideologies and concepts, all these fancy ideas humans came up with against this yardstick. Not some weird, twisted, invented forms imported from some other place. You measure everything with the yardstick of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not the other way around. You don't measure him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam based on some man-made thing. You measure them <laughs> based on the yardstick of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this blessed deen that Allah azza wa jal has blessed us, has honored us, has uplifted us, has empowered us with. And we're not saying that the 
theories and ideologies and concepts that humans have come up with and civilizations have come with aren't any good. We're not saying that. There's some truth and some good in everything. But what are you measuring it against? Measure it against the sun, <laughs> the nur of the Prophet And so with that, inshallah, you'll have your akhira vision and be wearing those akhira glasses to bring all the haziness back into full view. And I pray, inshallah, that that helps us recover from some of the psycho-spiritual dissonance that we find ourselves in, especially in these modern times. And that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people who heed these reminders, who are granted gatherings like this one and teachers such as these to remind us and that we actually do upon these reminders and that we're not held against these are not held against us on the day of judgment ya allah help us to implement what we have learned and grant us knowledge that is beneficial to us and make us from those ya rabbi who you are pleased with that on that last day when we stand alone before you between your hands alone that you are pleased with our answers and that we are united with the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the highest levels of jannah and with the Salihin and the Shuhada and all of the Anbiya and all those who, have stri who strive to do good. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from me and from you, accept this blessed Jum'ah in this blessed month of Rabi'a al-Awwal. And we pray, inshallah, that we are followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in full accordance and not in any level of dissonance with those akhira glasses on. Barakallahu feekum, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahumma ala al-hadi Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, ajma'i. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Rania. Um, if it's okay with you, we'll jump right into the Q&A. Um, if you guys, everyone who is here, if you have a question, please, uh, this is the time to type it in the chat. I do have... Um, an, on an anonymous question. Um, we've been taught uh, how to have consistency. That's what it says, but I think I can elaborate a little bit. You know, how do we not lose those glasses? You know, everyone's losing their glasses all the time. We're leaving their contacts in the car, right? Um, how do we get that, you know, that LASIK, that permanent LASIK like, like I got <laughs> a few years ago, alhamdulillah. Well, you know, subhanAllah, even the Lasix requires kind of uh, mm -hmm. renewals every so often, exactly. which is actually the answer to my to this question, inshallah. May Allah bless the questioner. Um, it, there's nothing that is, there's no one solution or one that pill, for lack of a better word, that I can give you, and it's one and done. It's actually consistent every day, day in and day out. And I'll tell you, if you put yourself in the company of those who remind you, whether these be teachers of spirituality, even if it's virtual, it's been amazing to me this ever since the pandemic, how connected we've all been virtually. So if you're saying, I, I don't have teachers nearby, there are ways to connect virtually. And then a suhba saliha, right? A good, righteous companionship. People who remind you, right? Who pick you up, who are willing to be, as the hadith calls us, when they describe what brothers and sisters are to each other in Islam, they are like mirrors. They hold up the mirror to you and they show you the reality of yourself. And so when you have slipped, when you're in a slump, they help pick you back up and remind you. Now, some people feel very uh, uncomfortable having others remind them, but actually it's for the best. And even the concept of having a guide or a teacher I remind you something very powerful because we talked today about stadiums. So let's continue with the sports examples and talk about how even the best athletes, world-class athletes, Olympians, all have coaches. They all have coaches. And that Olympian may be the one that they, they have the gold medal or multiple gold medals and their coach may not have had a single medal, but they still take them as a coach because they are ahead of them on that road. And so we all need guides and we all need friends, right? Brothers and sisters in the faith. And put yourself in these gatherings and these with these people, with these situations that will continue to remind you to dust off your, your glasses, right? To clean them off, right? Every so often to put on or not forget your contacts, right? And then sometimes you need to go back to the eye doctor to get your vision checked again. It changes over time. And so that's my, um, my, my honest 
uh, response to this is that it really does take uh, effect. Not just, you can't just do this completely alone. Allah created us in a system of families and communities, and it requires all of that to be able to continue to be consistent in this way. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, I can, I can say from experience these days we have that word, you know, hashtag mentor, right? But it's it's popular for a reason because it's it works. Everybody needs a mentor, you know, alhamdulillah. Um, we have another question. As a first year medical student in the West, how can I maximize my efforts for the sake of Allah and be successful within a career where haram is often required? Networking at pubs, etc. Yes, may Allah bless you, may Allah bless you, mashallah. Well, first and foremost is intention. The verses that we recited today have a lot to do with intentionality. Remind yourself why you're in this medical studies in the first place or whatever career, anybody who's listening to this, whatever career you're doing, whatever it is you're doing out there, mashallah. And remind yourself and make sure that the intention aligns with what Allah wants. Because if the intention, and I, when I speak to most people like myself that went into the medical field, it's a field of service. They want to help others. That's the, the quintessential you know, answer. I want to help others. Then making sure that that help of others is done in accordance to the rules Allah has set forward for us, whether the rules of gender interactions or the rules of what is halal and haram. So in your case, as a future physician, bioethics, right? Knowing what the Islamic bioethics are, even of the very medicine you practice. But in addition to all of that, there's the social aspect in most of our jobs and careers and life in general. And here, such as mentioned, the example that was mentioned was networking at pubs and you're right. And the medical field, at least where I am, I'm sure this is, sounds like you might be somewhere else in the West, maybe um, in the UK or such, but like, I don't know where people use the word pubs, but maybe somewhere in Europe, mashallah. But whether they're bars or pubs or whatever it may be, even if they're not in the actual pub, there's often heavily alcohol involved in so many of the social networking of these careers. This is true of medicine, of engineering, of law, of, of so many careers, subhanAllah. And you, there's a negotiation that has to happen or a sacrifice of realizing that your networking is going to happen outside of the pubs <laughs> and your networking may Allah will bless will bless that effort because of the intention behind it and will you miss some opportunities possibly but the opportunities that were not written for you were never meant for you in the first place it's a beautiful saying that Imam Shafi is famous for saying and also it is said that the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned the same concept what was meant for you will surely find you. And what was not meant for you never missed you in the first place. <laughs> and so network, yes, but in the halal spaces and in the ways in which would be pleasing to Allah and that would keep with the intention of why you're in this field. But if you lose yourself and lose that intentionality, you may get dunyawi success, like the big philanthropist who named, renamed our medical school, <laughs> or you may get lots of money, you may get fame, but you may not be mentioned in the great gatherings of the angels or in the higher levels of, of reaching those levels of Jannah. Your main name would be, may be completely missing from Jannah. And then is it really worth it that you networked in the pub? So things to think about. Yes, sometimes they seem like big sacrifices, but nothing is a big sacrifice to live in accordance of what Allah asked us for and with that proper akhirah vision. And wallahi, when you do that, when you do that with akhirah vision, with ihsan, with itqan, with that excellence and with that intentionality for Allah, you can't imagine the kind of doors he opens for you. Door after door after door after door. Try it and find out, inshallah, and then come back and let us know how successful you were in the deen and the dunya, inshallah. Yes, subhanAllah. I think you kind of answered the next question as well. Somebody is asking, um, sometimes the uh, akhirah glasses are quite frightening if we're seeing the next world, but sometimes the glasses are deliberately smudged with fear, which I think is so interesting the way they've worded it. Um, I think you've touched a little bit on this um, with your last answer as well, but if you'd like to elaborate a little bit, because it's so relatable for people who've had glasses, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes like for me, it's like, I'm too lazy to kind of clean it up, right? Um, but I, how do you differentiate? I guess I can add another level to this question, right? How do we differentiate? Is it is it lack of knowledge? Is it fear? Is it just sheer laziness? It could be all of the above, potentially. It could be all of the above, potentially. 
Um, the fear part is interesting, and here's where I'll invite the questioner to think about this, not as fear of um, when people think of the akhira, they may be thinking of um, punishment. I, I want you to think of akhira and think of Jannah, <laughs> right? Yes, Jahannam is a reality too, but I want you to think of Jannah because then the fear starts to dissipate. And so much of what you do, you do out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of all that he's blessed us with and love of Rasulullah. That love will carry you so much further than fear will. People talk about when you ask them, why do you pray or why do you wear hijab or why do you give in charity? And they say, I don't want to go to Jannah. I don't want to go to Jahannam, excuse me. I don't want to go to hellfire. I don't want to go to hellfire. And and um, that's, the, their, their, that's their intention or the impetus for their prayers. And I ask, well, what about love? And I find that for so many people, that concept of doing things for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually lacking. It, it's, it's, um, it's like a chapter that was missed in the book of studies related to Islam. It either wasn't taught or wasn't taught sufficiently enough. Or the perspective from which they learned the deen was often one that was dull and dreary. And it had a lot of fear and talk of hellfire. And while, again, it is important to stay balanced, you have to stay balanced between both concepts, it is really important to know love and to do things for the intention of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understanding that there is Jannah and it's a reality. And when you start to see the Akhirah in those glasses, with those set of glasses on, it's not really scary anymore. There's not fear there because you know as a believer you're going to make it to Jannah. We just hope it's from the first moment, right? And so that's where the motivation is <laughs> to be there from the beginning, the very beginning, and preferably without any previous judgment or hisab, so that you are, when you stand there, you're forgiven and you're taken straight to Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. So inshallah, I hope that helps the person who's asking this. It's really important to reframe that concept of love as best as you can. Um, another question, which uh, reminds me of what you were talking about, that the sense of healthy urgency, right? Not like the rush, rush, or we're going to be late for school urgency, but like the sense of healthy urgency. Um, is there a level of healthy anxiety um, of uh, there's a lot of anxiety assessing if you're doing things right. Is Allah pleased with me? What do I do? What do I need to be doing more of? Yes, absolutely. In fact, in fact, the same teacher I mentioned to you often would say to us, um, there is a thing called healthy anxiety. And that healthy anxiety is as such. It's when you start to connect the dots. Not because we have the answer, because we won't. There's no revelation after the Prophet ﷺ. But let's say somebody does something that they are remorseful about. They, are, they know that they shouldn't have done that thing, they shouldn't have said that, they shouldn't have looked at that, they shouldn't have eaten that, they shouldn't have gone there, done that. And they're remorseful. And then, subhanAllah, something happens that's not pleasant, <laughs> right? That's It's a difficult thing that happens. Maybe a trial or tribulation comes. And they sit back and they think to themselves, why? And so they start to attempt to connect the dots. And our teachers warn us, our spiritual teachers warn us from trying to say that one plus one equals two in the spiritual domain because you don't know what Allah knows. It may seem like, oh, because I did that wrong thing, he's punishing me for this. As so many people I talk to, this seems to be they do this one plus one equals two equation, but they try to do this with God and it doesn't work that way with God. It may be that this trial and tribulation comes and actually, actually, it's a blessing. Actually, it's a refinement of your character. Actually, it ends up being better for you, even though at that very moment you couldn't see it. Because with every difficulty Allah has promised, he's tucked within it, ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Right? And he repeats it. And so this concept of you have to know that only Allah truly knows why this thing happened. But a healthy anxiety says, "Yeah, Allah, I don't. Th I, I, I'm remorseful for what I've done." And you try to, you try to connect the dot, right? The hikmah, the wisdom, the why, the hakim, the wise person is trying to connect those dots, realizing that they don't know the final answer. The final answer is with Allah. But it's worth taking yourself to account before you're taken to account. Hasabu qabla an tu hasabu. Right, like make sure you're giving, put yourself, taking yourself to account before you're taken to account. And so, if that is what it is, 
then that is a healthy form of anxiety of Allah, I want to do better. I want to make sure you've forgiven me. I want to make sure that this is not going to be repeated again. You do your three your steps of tawbah, of repentance, right? And it starts with acknowledging that something was wrong, right? Committing <laughs> to not doing it again, right? And asking for forgiveness. And so when you do that, this is all good. And then that, our teachers say, it's a health anxiety. But the kind of anxiety a person's like, they've done their toba 15 times and they're still wondering if Allah's forgiven them. No, you do your toba once and the rest is on Allah. And the rest is on Allah, right? And that's the difference between healthy and unhealthy anxiety, spiritually speaking. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Rania. Um, I'll just like to... Um, pause for a few minutes for some announcements and we'll have you right back on. I'll give people a chance to ask some more questions and a chance for you to drink some water. <laughs> SubhanAllah. JazakAllah um, You, If you are just joining us right now, you are listening to Dr. Rania, uh, who has joined us for our Friday Gems Reflection and Lesson, Alhamdulillah. I'd like to take this moment to invite you to become an Ansar. Join our Ansar circle at Celebrate Mercy this month, in this blessed month of Rabi'l Awal, on this blessed day of Friday, alhamdulillah. Um, we are, alhamdulillah, almost there. Our goal is to reach 313 Ansar in this blessed month. Why become an Ansar? There are many, many perks um, associated with being an Ansar. Of course, there's different giving levels you can choose from. Your sponsorship, your sustainership helps us to bring you these quality programs, this access to knowledge throughout the year, not just in Rabi'l Awal, not just in Ramadan, but to bring make knowledge accessible for everyone, wherever they are in the world. Um, the offer still stands, inshallah, if you become an Ansar over this weekend, you will be eligible to win a $450 valued wooden sandal that is a prize you will get if you become an insar this weekend we will enter you in that raffle to win this beautiful addition to your home inshallah ta'ala um if you are enjoying this um uh, session with dr rania go ahead and share with your family and friends i am getting a lot of whatsapp messages <laughs> i don't think they know i'm here <laughs> alhamdulillah which is so cool um so go ahead and share Keep asking your questions. We are, and if you're benefiting, um, do uh, become an Ansar at celebratemercy.com.org slash Ansar. Like I'll bring Dr. Rania up right away. Um, Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Rania. Um, Dr. Rania, we have a question about how do I love Allah? Where can I find this love? Or how should I make my intention when giving something or doing something or doing acts? Mm -hmm. MashaAllah, the fact that you're asking about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already tells me that you are, mashallah, on your way, if not already there, mashallah. The, the thing about loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about intentions is an amazing thing. I love the concept of intentions. Look, every book of fiqh, many of which are behind me right now, starts every section of every uh, every chapter literally starts with intention, right? Because we know the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Inna al-a'malu bin niyat," right? That every action is done with intention, has to be done with intention for it to count. And so, what a beautiful thing when it comes to acts of khair, acts of good. Here we learn that unlike some of the acts of worship, where you have to have intention. Right? You can't just you know, aimlessly face any direction and sort of just pray and it counts. You actually have to have intention to pray and then face the correct direction of the qibla and so on. But when you do acts of khayr, it actually turns out they all count. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing. I want you to think about that when you do um, anything that you do, have a general intention at the start of your day. Literally, at the start of your day and say, Ya Rabbi, my intention is to love you and to love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ask that your all your actions be aligned in that way. It's a beautiful thing because SubhanAllah, we have these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talk about even a smile is charity. So every smile that you give, right? To first 
your family members because charity starts at home, right? So when you smile at the members of your family, the children, the elders, the sp your spouse, whoever, parents, whoever is there, right? That starts the day with loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing these actions to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you open your door and you head out to the neighborhood and you say hi to the neighbors, right? And they may not be Muslim or maybe they are, but whatever it is, even just the, the warm greeting, the safety that you've created as, from neighbors, right? Ha touches on another hadith that talks about that a believer is one whose neighbors are safe from them, right? Then you go out into your car or into your walk of the day or onto the public transportation and every step or every mile or every couple miles or whatever it may be that you're taking if you do all of that with intention of wherever you get from point a to point b is a form of worship out of the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it counts so your commute in traffic that you dread suddenly becomes something that is actually counted for you and not against you there's no more road rage or kind of cursing at the person <laughs> kind of cut you off but rather you realize this is actually because my intention is to go to work or to drop my kids off to the school or to this program or to go to the community service or whatever it may be and all of that then the distance that you travel to get there also counts just as the action itself and subhanallah even when you make an intention and couldn't fulfill it because let's say you came down with the flu mail to protect us right even when you couldn't fulfill it, you still got the hasanat for it because you merely made the intention for khayr, for good. SubhanAllah, Allah is so kind with us, so generous, truly with us. And that itself should increase all this love for us. So I, what, I, what I encourage you to do is what we would call in our, in, our, in our field a cognitive reframing. Try to reframe the very things that you're doing and then using the other word that I use, a psycho-spiritual reframing of saying, Ya Allah, everything that I do, everything I do from the minute I wake up, from the minute I go to sleep, all of it can actually be counted as forms of worship with the correct intentions. And so try to find a way to reframe everything you do, even the things that you don't really like, like washing dishes, right? And so you're sitting there at the dish pan and you say, so that Allah loves a clean place and the angels are attracted to what is clean and I need to feed this family <laughs> or myself. And so therefore all of this is done in worship of you and love of you, Ya Allah. So therefore it counts as a form of love. So reframe, psycho-spiritual reframing, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, subhanAllah. Um, Dr. Anya, it's just, you know, it's it's the age of hacking life. And that is a wonderful life hack, a general intention in the beginning of the day, right? SubhanAllah. Um, we have another question here. I think look, we can take a couple more, inshallah. How do I keep hope and happiness with Allah when the odds are not being answered? I would like to add a tangent, a, a little bit, add on to that. Um, how do you, you know, what do you say to people who say, oh, that is just, you're just so annoyingly optimistic, <laughs> right? How can you be so optimistic all the time, right? Even though a person who seems to be optimistic, they know it hurts. They're human, right? But um, so I'm just going to combine those two together and, um, you know, hopefully it'll be of care to somebody here, inshallah. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I don't think that it's, um, and I don't think it's proper though for the believer to have false optimism. I think we have to be rooted in reality. I love this deen of ours because it's a religion of, it's a pragmatic religion, but it is one that heavily emphasizes love and connection and spiritual connection and connects us to the unseen like the angels we just mentioned right and so i want to encourage you to kind of think about how you can uh, look i'll go but here's the best way to encourage you is a dua that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make and he would raise his hands and he would say oh allah make us from those who have happiness in both abodes suada adarain that we are happy in both abodes, meaning the dunya and the akhira. So the believer is not one that's meant to be glum and serious and uh, all the time. You, you need to know when you're serious, right? And you need to know when to be smiley and happy. And there are times that you need to know when to be pragmatic and to kind of really kind of move forward and when to kind of take it easy and kind of take a step back. And we saw that in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, in his blessed seerah, you see all of the above. You see times where he's relaxing, 
and times when he's very serious, kind of really motivated and, and focused on something. And there are times, mashallah, when he is serious. And there are times when he's sitting with his companions and they're enjoying something funny, right? Or a sahabi that makes him laugh to where you can see his back molars, right? Smile so big that you could see his back molars. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see it all kind of in the this perfection that Allah created in him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so I encourage you to use this dua. Oh Allah, make us from those who are happy in both abodes. And what that means is sometimes the happiness isn't laughter and and and, uh, and and big smiles all the time sometimes the happiness is actually deep in the heart it's deep-seated so you meet somebody who actually went through outwardly it looks like a terrible terrible accident or tribulation or major loss i mean you look at the ummah right the floods the earthquakes the things that are happening and you say how does a person smile again after such a thing how we have met people, subhanAllah, who have brothers of ours in the community who have been falsely imprisoned since they were a youth, yani still a teenager, and did not get released. False imprisonment, which was later, you know, said it was true that it was false imprisonment, 30 years. So they came out in their 40s. And, you're in, and yet the biggest smile on someone's face I've ever seen. And you say, how do you come out of something like that, not a bitter person, an angry person? And you know what their answer is? Allah took everything away from me. But he gave me something I didn't have before I went in. And that was Islam and knowing Allah. And I would do it all over again. And that might sound out of this world to you. But I kind of see where the person's coming from, subhanAllah. That because if they had come out ah, 40 years later, and they would have been bitter and without Allah. So imagine, subhanAllah. So sometimes, again, this it's a powerful thing. This field of psychology is actually quite powerful if you do it in the right way. Psycho spiritual psychology, especially Islamic psychology, where you can really reframe things properly. And you understand that even people who have had tribulation, sometimes you see it's not a smile on their face, but it's a, a yaqeen. It's a certainty in the existence of Allah and the protection of Allah and the knowing that something better is coming for them in the hereafter than what they've lost in this dunya. That gives a person happiness that doesn't necessarily show as giddiness and smilingness, but it shows in a qana or a, a, a strong um, commitment and belief in this in Allah and in his his was his divine wisdom. Those are the happy people. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Dr. Rania. A question about a book. Is Dr. Rania? Uh, when is your uh, when is is she writing a book? When is the book coming out, Doctor Anya? <laughs> the self help book we all need. <laughs> right oh, oh, subhanallah, self help book. I was like, yes, actually, there is a book coming out, but um, we'll have to work on something that's more self help. These are all academic books. <laughs> Shalom, I love bless you. Um, the latest books we've been working on have been. Uh, uh, the one that's probably coming out the soonest is the one related to the Madistans, which are the Islamic healing institutions. Um, you know, a couple of people have been working on this very hard, mashallah, and uh, just spent a sabbatical kind of really working on writing that. There's a book um, that we're very excited about because we just signed a contract for it, which is on uh, the concept of an Islam, the Islamic concept of meditation. So Islamic uh, cognitive, uh, I keep using the word cognitive because we asked that earlier today, subhanAllah, but uh, Islamic contemplative, that's the word, contemplative meditation, which is basically our tafakkur and tadabbur from our own tradition, how to do that, inshallah. Mm -hmm. And we have another academic book on Muslim mental health in general. So as I mentioned, these are more academic in nature. But make dua for me, inshallah, that something um, uh, as what you all wish <laughs> to come will pass. Inshallah, inshallah. I'm, I'm already thinking of combining you know, um, using those books for my journaling sessions, inshallah. <laughs> Sounds I'm wonderful. Jazakallah sure. um, Dr. Rani, it is always, always an honor to have you here. And um, oh, you know, we, have, we continue to benefit from all of our teachers, all of our teachers, but especially the work you're doing. I, I you know, it's just, um, it's so, so important. And may Allah continue to use you to help transform mm -hmm. us, increase us in knowledge, to help us rewire our brains, uh, you know, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, may Allah bless you and your family. 
And we can't wait to have you on again, inshallah. Please keep me and my families in your dua. I'll keep celebrate mercy in all of those who've been tuning in, mashallah, in my duas as well. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.